What's up, buffheads? It's Remy Raccoon, and welcome back to Racklog, the series where I talk about games I've been playing from my backlog that I don't want to dedicate a whole gosh dang video to. Which is a bold-faced lie, because this time around that's exactly what I did. This episode of Racklog is a compilation of my previous six Racklog reviews, which were uploaded individually over the course of the past year and a bit. So if you've already seen them, you don't have to watch this, but you should anyway, because I have a condition called empty walletophobia, which is a fear of having no money to buy chippies, directly combated by people watching my videos and giving me ad revenue, and also maybe liking and subscribing. But yeah, uh, anyway, bunch of funny little games for you today, including Trash Can Simulator, the most annoying game ever made, what the f was Volition thinking, Dragons of the Blue Variety, what the f was Turn 10 thinking, and a walking simulator for children. When will I play normal games? I think it's time to take a good look at reboots and think about why they exist. If I were in charge of a game getting the reboot treatment, I'd be doing so to bring that series to the modern era, to update the gameplay and bring it to a contemporary standard. I'd also use that opportunity to do something new with the IP, not regurgitate the same game again. Good reboots like this exist, like Kid Icarus Uprising, which takes an old 2D platformer and turns it into a mostly on-rail shooter. Then there's the myriad of classic games that got a modern facelift but still retain their core gameplay, like Battletoads and Blaster Master Zero, or the others that ended up changing things up a bit to fit the modern gaming landscape like Doom, Wolfenstein, Tomb Raider. A reboot can be a good thing. Sometimes you want to tell a story with the same premise or within the same universe, but you already reach the narrative's natural conclusion. I'd say Ratchet and Clank 2016 felt a bit like this, only for them to chuck a DMC Devil May Cry and continue the previously established series anyway, but when Saints Row was revealed to be getting a reboot, I thought that might have been a good idea. The original Saints Row had humble beginnings as a GTA clone, but it quickly evolved into its own thing, not afraid to parody the series it was being compared to. Then the Saints turned into a multimedia empire, followed by the boss, your player character, becoming president of the United States and getting isekai'd into an alien simulation where they're given superpowers that would make Homelander soil as bridges, and at that point it was kinda like, well, where do the saints go from here? So a reboot makes sense. Conjure up a new set of characters, a new origin story, and bring everything back down to moderately zany, which, after the polarizing Saints Row 4, sounded pretty good. So why did they just remake Saints Row but worse? While I don't think it's on the same level as other similarly dunked on games of the past few years like Balan Wonderworld or Babylon's Fall, Saints Row is still a tough sell. An open world devoid of life, a story that spins its wheels for far too long, writing that's way more missed than hit, and some of the most basic and unimaginative mission design in recent memory, not to mention the myriad of bugs sprinkled all over the place like your mum sprinkling too many hundreds and thousands when making fairy bread for your fifth birthday. It's really hard to recommend Saints Row over any other game in the series. It's the same as the old games, but with barely an imaginative bone in its body. And that's why, more than anything, I don't hate Saints Row, I'm just really disappointed. I think one area the game gets a lot of unnecessary hate is the story, which centers around your created character and your three roommates trying to make rent and pay off student loans. The natural response to this common everyday dilemma is to start their own criminal empire, as we all would, of course. And it at least does start off kind of interesting. You start out working with a private militia who wants to thin out gang violence in the city, while two of your roommates Kevin and Nina are a part of said gangs, albeit opposing ones. That's a neat angle, and I kind of wish they'd stuck with it for longer because it's not even a few missions later where everyone's fired or disowned and left on the curb. Nevertheless, I don't mind this setup. Their response to their financial situation is over the top in a way that I think perfectly suits the Saints Row universe. They just kind of don't do anything with it. There are occasionally speeches and ramblings about how capitalism is kneecapping regular people and how landlords suck, but nothing about the game's writing works off of that concept. Like, sure, we're gonna be our own boss as the game keeps trying to shove down our throats, but what about driving around to find Happy Meal toys reflects upon that? Missions themselves end up feeling disjointed as a result, like their episodes in a sitcom that resets the status quo after every week. The idols capture Kevin and they're about to blow his shirtless ass sky high, so you go rescue him. Los Panteros wreck the car Nina has been working on for years, so you go sabotage their car forge. Marshall, the militia you used to work for, declares that they own the Saints because of the non-compete agreement you signed while under their wing, so you humiliate their boss before… settling the dispute. None of these missions have any rippling effect on the story, and are in the same level of inconsequentiality as the missions where you do truly pointless things, like the Mad Max cross high fantasy LARP that spans over multiple main and side missions. It's like the writers had no story to tell, so they fattened up the main plotline with pointless detours that mostly have no bearing on the final act. 
Weird that I've played two games this year that have aimless narratives and drawn out laugh sections, what the heck? At least if the missions were at all interesting, this wouldn't be so much of an issue, but most of the game is just kind of boring. 90% of it is driving to different places and shooting people. Like, okay, sure, you could say that about any open world shooter, if you were dumb as f Like, I think a lot of people forget about how good Grand Theft Auto V is nowadays. There's a lot of just shooting dudes in that, sure, but you were also stealing submarines, doing yoga, destroying houses, carrying out full-on heists. Even though the actual gameplay is just kind of, you know, how you going? It's the spectacle, the variety that pull me through that campaign. Saints Row, meanwhile, finds every excuse it can to turn every mission into a simple shootout. And it's aware of this. They constantly say they couldn't be fucked forming actual plans and just go, oh, I was just thinking of shooting everyone. <laughs> there are times where it sets up a mission that sounds like it's going to be something different before it simply devolves into a meager firefight or two. There's one mission that's supposed to be a team building exercise where every character gets to choose an activity for the whole group to do, but every time they're either interrupted by attacking gang members or one of the group will say, oh actually I think I'll make killing these guys my activity. Or there's another mission that's a big train heist and someone says, hey do we have a plan? And the boss says, oh I was just thinking about jumping on the train and shooting everyone who gets in the way. God, how riveting, how exhilarating. Even the aforementioned LARP falls victim to this. It starts off kind of charming. There's unique non-lethal animations for takedowns, everyone talks with a ye old accent, and you use dark guns instead of real weapons, although running the bastards over is still fine. But again, this just evolves into a series of boring one-note firefights. These missions could have been something different for a change, but it's like the writers and mission designers were adverse to evoking any sort of imagination. Occasionally you'll also do an on-rail shooting section, or maybe glide around in your wingsuit, other times you'll get to tow stuff behind you as you make some sort of getaway, the latter of which is actually super fun sometimes, but I could count on maybe one hand how many other truly unique scenarios there are. This extends to the side activities too. There's a lot to do, so if you're the kind of person who loves doing literally the exact same thing over and over again for dozens of hours then you're in luck son. Within each of the 15 districts you have a metric ass ton of somewhat optional missions from the more disposable side hustles and discoveries to the more important business ventures which become a requirement to progress. At some point in the story you're able to build businesses throughout the city and each one comes with its own quest line in huge quotation marks. Near the end of the story you'll be required to fully complete two of these business ventures and after the credits roll you'll need to beat five of them to build the Saints Tower. So they gotta be pretty decent if the game's forcing you to complete some of them right? Oh absolutely, they put their whole Saint Zussie into these. Like the toxic waste disposal venture, where you find a truck loaded with barrels of nuclear waste and drive it back to the disposal facility. 14 times! Or the one where you tow cars places. 10 times. Maybe, I, I, I can't remember and I'm too lazy to find the footage, but my point is, no, they in fact did not put their whole Saint Susi into this. Road blocking story progression is annoying enough, but doing so by forcing you to essentially complete the same mission around 10 times is a total failure of game design. The approach to side missions should be being allowed to do them at your own pace and sampling a bit of everything, not grinding away at the same quest line because of arbitrary progression requirements. Though in fairness, some of them aren't very long. I ended up finishing the LARP and Alpha for test ventures as they were only three or four missions long each and the latter does give you a pretty cool weapon that attaches to enemies and vehicles and sends them flying. My god, the game needed more stuff like this because for a fleeting moment I was having honest to goodness fun. But that doesn't change the fact that this is a very shitty way to pad out the game. And on top of that you can also eliminate threats in each district to increase payouts from your businesses but this is just more monotony piled on top of already existing monotony. Shoot a few dudes, destroy a vehicle, maybe take out some drones, it's all busy work with no purpose. In that sense, it reminds me of Watch Dogs, another game with a lot of side content that was basically redoing the same basic mission over and over again until you saw your completion rate rise up. But there's a key difference between Watch Dogs and Saints Row. The former, I would argue, actually has pretty solid gunplay. Saints Row, oh it's bad. <laughs> no string of words I could form would be able to accurately portray how putrid the shooting controls are, at least with a controller. So the game has aim acceleration, which if you don't know, is a thing where when you push the right stick to turn the camera or move the crosshair, there's a short moment where the rotation speed starts out a bit slower before reaching max speed the longer you hold that direction down. When you let go, this obviously resets, except in Saints Row where it does not. Instead, it's more like it 
forgets that you've stopped moving the right stick. So when you go to move it again, it stays at that max speed and may do so for a few more movements of the right stick until it finally resets. What this results in is a wildly unpredictable and near unusable aiming system where the only way you're going to hit your target is if you go into settings and turn auto aim up to full, where pressing the left trigger automatically locks onto the enemy if they're in the crosshairs general vicinity. Not like that helps during on rails chase segments where the sensitivity is set to like a bajillion for no good fucking reason. Combat itself is almost exactly the same as the older games at its core and it's fine, I guess? Like, you shoot at some slightly spongy enemies who take headshots like wake-up slaps, you dodge with B, there's a mechanic where you regain a chunk of your health by performing takedowns on enemies like Doom with Millennials, you can hold the right bumper to perform abilities that run on a cooldown like leeching health by doing damage, tossing grenades, summoning fellow saints, it's overall just fine. It's not particularly creative and those abilities either are super basic or don't even work half the time, but whatever. But between this basic combat loop and a lack of variety in enemies, it gets kind of tiresome pretty quickly and it's certainly not interesting enough to carry you through all those side activities. At least those inexcusably bad aiming controls could be fixed in a patch, I guess. But even if a patch suddenly gives Saints Row the greatest shooting controls of all time, that doesn't suddenly make combat interesting. God knows how I've gone this long without mentioning the very questionable state the game launched in though. Something something Bethesda game, something something Fallout 76, sure, okay, but gosh dang this game's broken. I'm not sure how else to tackle this, so I'm just going to read off a bunch of stuff that I encountered through my playthrough. During one of the Atcher side hustles, enemies got stuck outside of the mission's safe zone, so I had to spray and pray from afar. If I had run out of ammo, I might have had a minor gaming moment. In one of the main missions, however, the same thing happened, except instead of the enemies being just across the street, they spawned on the highway above me, and there was no way to reach it within the mission's safe zone. So I had to use rockets and hope that not only did they make contact, but actually killed them, seeing as for some reason enemies can just tank rockets in this game. My rockets of course weren't enough, but then one of the enemies died randomly anyway and the mission continued as normal. Sure. Trying to eliminate threats to increase my business's payout, I was tasked with destroying a police van. My first attempt, no matter what I did to the van, its health meter wouldn't budge, like the thing was made out of 20 year old Nokias. During my next session, I tried to blow up the same van and it went fine. At one point I tried to commandeer a martial chopper, but for some reason the view kept zooming in where all I could see was a close up of a bunch of wall textures. Exiting and entering the chopper again did not fix this. In fact, this happened multiple times throughout my playthrough, I'd hop into a car and the camera would get stuck zooming zoomed in as if I was aiming my gun. Sometimes hopping out and back in would fix this, other times not. During an early mission, my character started reloading infinitely. Whether this was a glitch or a half-brained attempt to get an infinite clip, I'm not too sure. At one point you get hover bikes. Sounds cool. Except they handle like us and aiming their stupid gun feels like threading a needle sometimes, let alone the fact that they just stop randomly. Once I tried to initiate a takedown, but my character just did an A pose and cancelled out of it, a failed attempt at asserting dominance. During the prison break mission, the game plays Get Free by the Vines, an absolute banger, but then the game said, oh wait, you're actually enjoying something in this game? Lamau, no. And the music just cuts out. You, you can't tell me that was intentional. I'm sure there's a joke about wanting to get free from this game somewhere, but I'm above such lowbrow humor. The most egregious example of the game not cooperating with me was a session where, for some reason, I couldn't do anything except move for a bit until mashing all the buttons fixed things. Not long after that, I wasn't allowed to change my weapon or use any of my abilities, so I was stuck with a rocket launcher and its impressive ammo capacity of six glued to my hands. So I tried to do stuff that didn't require guns for a bit, hoping the issue would fix itself, so I went and did a side mission that was timed, except except I didn't know that until I failed meters away from the objective because the game decided not to display a timer. After that I still couldn't change weapons so I quit out of the game and back in twice and still couldn't change guns. I was ready to call it quits right there and then but thankfully giving my Xbox the hard reset treatment fixed things up. Nearly got softlocked because I couldn't change weapons. What a fucking game man. There were many, many more minor mishaps throughout my 19 hours with the game, mostly revolving around crummy vehicle physics or me aggroing traffic or the numerous times I hopped out of a car only for the door to swing back and damage me. I need more than two hands to count how many times that happened, but at least that bug's funny. Dare I say charming in a way. The not being able to change guns and almost getting softlocked? Not so much. 
for the sake of fairness, there are some things I like about Saints Row. The customization in particular is really good. I started out making a low effort human version of Remy, complete with eye makeup and their iconic orange hoodie, but partway through the game I decided to change things up a bit and become a feminine cowboy, a femboy if you will. As I said earlier, I don't think the writing's awful. Yeah, sure, there are a few moments of pure unadulterated cringe. This is gonna be an epic statement. That yacht's guarded AF. Dude, did you just say AF? Yeah, the abbreviation. Okay, first, we swear all the f***ing time. Second, it's only an abbreviation when you text. AF as f***. It's the same number of syllables. Okay, fine. This is gonna be an epic statement because that yacht is guarded as f***. And every last one of them is gonna learn what happens when you try to blow up a saint! Hells yeah! But it's not for spoken trailer levels of cringe at least. And there are plenty of accessibility options too, alongside difficulty sliders that affect things like damage dealt and received to how much ammo you find lying around, etc, etc. This is always good to see, but there's not much else to love. Santo Eliso is an open world that feels empty, devoid of the random events you'd find in other open world games. Many missions lack music at what feels like pivotal moments, which makes them feel kind of eerie. Car handling is unimpressive, as is the sense of speed, where the game's slowest trucks and hatchbacks feel like they're within the same league as the high-end exotics. Graphically, this game looks like a game made for 2014, released 8 years later after a publisher dispute, and despite this, it only sometimes runs at 60fps on my Xbox Series S. And the story spends too long Long trying to get going only to end on a dud twist and an underwhelming showdown. All of this made me think for a fleeting second, was Saints Row ever good? Were those fond memories of the second and third games blinded by nostalgia? So I fired up Saints Row the third for the heck of it and I feel dumb for even thinking that because I had more fun in the 45 minutes I played that than I did with almost anything in the reboot. Within those 45 minutes I robbed a bank, shot the front window of a plane and dove through it, free fell through the sky while dodging falling cars and shooting dudes in suits, raided an armory for guns, took out guards with drone strikes and listened to the Dillinger escape plan. In less than an hour, I'd not only enjoyed myself more than I have with the reboot, but I laughed way more too. Johnny Gat saying we traded our dicks in for pussies with his whole chest is funnier than anything the reboot tried to do. Hell, the deluxe edition of the reboot comes with the remastered version of Saints Row the <laughs> Third. Imagine giving people a copy of a good game with the deluxe edition of your crummy one. Saints Row is a pointless reboot. People have been crying foul about Saints Row, about how it's lost a lot of its character and traded it in for pandering to woke millennials, when that's literally the least important reason why you should dislike it. Not that it's true anyway. When instead, people should be upset that it just kinda sucks. Volition had the opportunity to update the series for current year, but instead they made a game that attempts to mimic the prior games that made this series so popular in the first place, without any of the charm or wit that made those games so irreverent. Instead, you've got a game that people on Twitter would leap at the chance to label as mid, but when you pair that with the abysmal shooting controls and the myriad of bugs and glitches that permeate the experience, you get a game that's just not fun. It has its moments, but they're lost behind walls and walls of unimaginative mission design, directionless writing, and game-breaking bugs. If you're interested in Saints Row, for the love of god, just pick up one of the older games. 3 and 4 got remastered recently, and 1 and 2 are $15 reduce on Xbox. Also, no penetrator. Worst game of the year. A genre I've always wanted to talk about more on this channel is the turn-based RPG. Aside from stuff like Digimon Story Cyber Sleuth and the trilogy of smelly sin videos I did on Final Fantasy X, there's been a sore lack of RPG representation on here, and in the future, I want to change that. The next RPG I was going to talk about was Lost Odyssey, a game that at the time of writing I consider one of my favourite games of all time, though I'm not sure how well it holds up just yet. I have started playing it and those opening hours can kiss my ass. But while searching my Xbox library one day, I discovered that somehow I own Blue Dragon. Blue Dragon was developed by Mistwalker, a Japanese American developer led by Final Fantasy veteran Hironobu Sakaguchi, and the studio that would go on to make Lost Odyssey. And looking at a bit of footage of the game, it was pretty clear that the two shared some DNA, and not just because they were turn-based RPGs. So I shelved Lost Odyssey for the moment and fired up Blue Dragon instead to see how Mistwalker got their start, and to see what this Final Fantasy vet would have in store for us. And honestly, it's kind of mid. Not in the way Twitter users call everything they don't like mid, but in the, wow, this game sure or does exist way. I enjoyed my time with it, but that was mostly owing to the battle system rather than anything else. That battle system though, it's a lot of fun. 
Blue Dragon adopts a similar turn-based style to Final Fantasy X, where you observe a turn order at the top of the screen and have to plan your moves around that. It starts off simple as expected, you know, trading blows and pegging potions at each other, but once you start to level up your shadows, it becomes way more interesting. These shadows are the game's main gimmick, and visually it's a pretty cool one, each party member's shadow transforming into a giant blue creature that stems from their feet and fights for them. The amount of times I tried to draw Shu's dragon shadow as a kid would probably be considered insane, as is the amount of times I completely butchered it. Spoiler alert, it was every time. Each character's shadow comes pre-installed with its own unique class, but as you level shadows up, they're able to unlock new classes and take on entirely new roles in combat. Attaining class levels unlocks new skills, which you can then assign to your shadow no matter what class it may be using. So, if you wanted to, Jiro could be assigned the white magic class, but take on skills from support or barrier magic classes, or Marumaru could be a swordmaster, but keep the monk's ability to charge attacks. Charging up attacks is actually a key component of Blue Dragon's combat though. Monks and mages, and those who inherit their skills, are able to charge their attacks, whether it be to apply extra effects or to potentially save a bit of MP, though this pushes them back in the turn order. You'll be able to determine exactly when you want your attack or spell to go off as well, so there are interesting decisions to be made at times. Do I cast this spell immediately with less of an effect, or do I risk taking hits before popping the spell off with higher power, or area of effect? Charging some spells, for example, changes how they function, whether they affect one target or a whole row, and this applies to magic cast on the enemy or on the party. Black magic spells also don't work exactly as you would think either. It's not just, oh, here's fire and water and wind and all that. Fire, for example, always strikes a single enemy. Wind can be charged up to affect a whole row. Water hits a whole row by default, and ground hits every enemy on the battlefield unless their little footsies are not planted firmly on the ground. But more than that, enemies have their own behavior and will react differently to certain methods of attack. You can disarm these discount hack sauruses, for example, by flinging wind magic at them, drastically decreasing their defense. Yeah. Some late game enemies I encountered didn't take kindly to my guys charging up physical attacks, which made them target those silly enough to do so. Or you can soak certain variants of the Pooh Snake with water spells to make them all mushy and susceptible to physical attack. Somehow, Blue Dragon having piles of poo as its weakest enemy still is not as bad as being able to grip shit in your bare hands in Dragon Quest, but still. And while in the overworld, you can target multiple enemies and initiate combat with them all at once, taking advantage of the natural rivalry between certain species and watching them duke it out right in front of you. That last thing actually doesn't get used a whole lot in the latter half of the game, and honestly you have to be so close to both groups of enemies that by the time you think of pulling them into battle together, you've probably already been hit by one and dragged into battle yourself. But regardless, all these systems make for surprisingly dynamic combat that had me pretty engaged all the way through. Admittedly, it is one of those games where any character can become anything, taking away from their individuality, and it feels a bit weighted towards acquiring specific class skills towards the end. Shu, Zola, and Marumaru were all assassins by the final dungeon, all having similar skill sets like charge attack, double attack, absorb HP, etc, etc, while Jiro and Kluke were both interchangeable as black and white mages, one just had barrier magic while the other had support magic. It felt like I had two distinct party members that had achieved mitosis at some point during their journey, but also they became women or tiny annoying little shits. In fairness, this is a problem that a fair few RPGs had around this time. Final Fantasy X and XII were the biggest offenders, but unlike Final Fantasy X, where once you hit post-game everyone but the fastest characters were rendered irrelevant, magic users always feel viable in Blue Dragon. Unlike those two, however, it's also insanely easy to bring the game to its knees. Once you unlock an overworld skill that immediately defeats any enemy you make contact with and gives you shadow points, you can level up the classes you want and nab all the best skills long before you even attempt the final dungeon. Coupled with accessories that give you double SP, and you'll face less than an hour of grinding before your annoying little children are outfitted with skills so overpowered that they'll just steamroll everything. Regardless of my issues with it, Blue Dragon still has a really fun combat system, and if you choose not to break the game, it remains consistently challenging throughout the 40-ish hours it takes to beat. I, I left it idle for the weekend, I swear to god. I really wish the rest of the game held up to the same standard though. Outside of combat, Blue Dragon is the most bog-standard RPG I've played in a good while, almost to the point that it becomes parody. When you're not watching your shadow trade blows with sentient pieces of crap, you're subject to pretty standard RPG progression. Going to a town, getting some new objective, heading to a dungeon, beating the boss and pressing forward. Blue Dragon uses a classic overworld style when moving between towns, dungeons and other places of interest while everything looks normal once you enter said places of interest. Visually though, the game's really muddy and lacking in detail. Character models are fine, sometimes even charming thanks to Dragon Ball Z and Dragon Quest artist Akio Toriyama being on board, but environments are pretty bland and this is only worsened by the strange depth of field effect that extends about as far as my Wii Wii will whenever Sony wisens up and greenlights Mod Nation races too. These dungeons are also a bit of a slog to trudge through as movement 
speed makes it look like I'm only tilting the left stick part way, and many areas tend to be needlessly big and empty. Some of the music to go with these towns and dungeons is also kind of irritating, to be honest. I have to actually turn my headphones down when visiting one of the camps, for example. Join. And with some of the town themes in general, they feel like they've been ripped from some other RPG altogether. On the flip side, there are some pretty nice dungeon themes. The main battle theme is decent if somewhat repetitive, but it'd be wrong of me not to mention the boss battle theme. It's an incredible collaboration composed by Nobuo Umatsu, with some pretty badass lyrics by Hironobu Sakaguchi and vocals done by none other than deep purple vocalist Ian Gillian. I don't know how this came to be, but it's one of the few times where I can't say I've wanted more battle themes because almost every boss battle being backed up by this power metal masterpiece is all one could and should ever want. Something I really dislike is how they place items throughout each area. You've still got treasure chests you can find of course, but for some reason they also place a lot of smaller items on objects in the background. Potions, minuscule amounts of gold, tiny bits of EXP and SP. Discovering this early on, I was convinced that eventually really good items would be hidden like this, so a decent chunk of the game was me grinding my face against walls and headbutting unassuming room decor, picking up every tiny item I could find until it became clear that the reward for doing so was negligible and I stopped doing it altogether about halfway in. I have no idea what the devs were thinking when they thought this would be at all an engaging way to explore each area, and if you end up playing this game as a result of this video, don't make the same mistake. It doesn't even feel particularly thoughtful, especially when you examine a bowl of fruit and it gives you 10 gold? Why? Who's slipping gold into a bowl of fruit? Is the fruit made of gold? Is this a jelly donut situation and the fruit is actually gold itself? How deep does this iceberg go? By far my least favourite part of Blue Dragon though is the story. When I play turn-based RPGs, I find that even my favourites can get a little repetitive after a while, but it's usually the narrative and characters that keep pulling me through that make me go, okay, yeah, nah, let's play some more, why not? Blue Dragon just doesn't have that going for it at all. The main party is either hugely irritating or hugely forgettable. Jira is a Caden from Mass Effect ass character who's got the personality of crusty bedsheets. Tara Strong is totally miscast as Kluk, giving her most flat delivery I think I've ever heard. Zola's the tall one, I guess. And Marumaru is cute, but there's only so much I can take of his shouting. Thankfully, they break his shouting up with more shouting. Except it's horny shouting instead. Don't just stand there. Come, come with me. You, 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 you. For who's supposed to be the main character though, Shu is pretty awful. He doesn't really have much of a driving force, he doesn't really go through much character development, and about the only thing that defines him is his refusal to give up and his insistence on saying so at every given opportunity. I won't give up! 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 Dang it! I won't give up! And I won't give up! I said I won't give up! I won't give up! I won't give up. I'll never give up. I won't give up! I won't give up! Why are we? We're being pulled up! What's going on? I know why! It's because I said I won't give up! Wait, no, I apologize. He does go through a character arc. After 25 or 30 hours of not giving up, he decides at one point that it's okay to give up sometimes. Riveting stuff, truly. But this I won't give up stuff is so goofy that it actively negates the emotional resonance of a couple of scenes, including this one, where a girl is about to commit suicide. Bit of a tonal whiplash for a game that looks like this, I know. But then Shu's like, Lemo, you fucking coward, don't give up. Like, cool, I don't know. I don't think a game with such juvenile characters, in the literal sense, not a detrimental one, can handle such heavy topics, especially when it responds to them with a shonen protagonist saying his funny catchphrase. And there's really not much to say about the overall plot either. A bunch of kids are 
are granted funny magic shadows and they want to use them to beat this old purple guy up and along the way they just kind of travel to towns and help them out with whatever issue they have. In that sense it's like Dragon Quest, you could point to almost any game in that series and it'll follow the same formula, mini plots within a grander narrative. But those mini plots are usually bolstered by memorable characters unless you're playing Dragon Quest 9. Those stories have layers, not many layers, but layers. In Dragon Quest 8 for example, you're not just going to a town of thieves and pilferers to progress the story, you learn more about one of your trusted party members there. You're not just helping a cowardly prince slay an overgrown lizard, you're learning more about the man betrothed to the old princess, your character's love interest, and why you should despise him and the arranged marriage. What do you learn then when you come across a town in the snowy mountains with a big force field around it when you step through it and get trapped within? You go in, you learn the people in there hate magic, then you fix the problem and everyone loves you and you move on. Nothing you do related to the characters you control, creating a disconnect between them and the plot that makes it hard to care. Doubly so when, oh, uh, spoiler alert, skip to here if you don't want to spoil the game for yourself, uh, I'll wait a sec. We good? Good. Doubly so when you get to the end and things totally spiral out of control. The planet splitting open, spawning Minecraft dirt blocks, blah blah blah, whatever, bit weird, who cares. When you get to the final boss it's revealed that Zola was working for the villain Nene all along, given a shadow by him in exchange for becoming a spy in one of the major towns in the game. But then she turns around and says, No, I would never betray my friends you big stinky, and offs the old codger. But then, <laughs> not even done, this little dude, Deathroy, this annoying little mother Fucker who's been talking like this the whole game. Land shark? Land shark? No intelligence at all. At all! It's any wonder they're so audacious. They're children. <laughs> the children, the children, the children! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you don't think much of him, right? He's basically the slug thing from Ratchet Deadlocked. Cool, now imagine that slug thing is actually a biomechanical god? It's a fun boss fight, mind, but it's also the stupidest looking final boss of all time. Poor looking ass. <laughs> This feels like a plot written by a grade schooler at times, or at least it feels like it was written for grade schoolers, but then it also has Shu saying stuff like that bastard! And then there's that one girl who nearly jumped off a cliff, it's like it didn't know what it wanted to be, and it suffers greatly for it. I'd always heard lots of good stuff about Blue Dragon, but I'm not sure I see what others see in it. Everything outside of the battle system is tedious, vapid, or flat out nonsensical. There's nothing interesting about the exploration, the characters stink, the story's barely there. But you know what? That combat system is just enough to leave a positive impression on me. It's dynamic and interesting enough to pull me through, and though maybe I wish I'd not gone out of my way to power level my characters and break combat with busted skills near the end, I still had a blast, smacking poo snakes with my sick ass dragon shadow guy. And it's also really interesting playing this and seeing how parts of it would later be used or improved in Mistwalker's next game, Lost Odyssey. Holding a button to charge attacks and magic feels similar to the ring system. The segmented stories you can find feel like a precursor to a thousand years of dreams. Some of the menu systems feel familiar. Hell, even a bunch of voice actors carry over between games. They share a lot of DNA, and that's great, because that means that they were able to take Blue Dragon, a game I thought to be simply okay, and make something even better out of it. Having said that, I'd still recommend Blue Dragon if you're a fan of the genre, at least for a single playthrough. Its storytelling and systems outside of battle are very much of an era gone by, but the battle system holds up pretty well. And you fight monsters while Ian Gillian occasionally wails about staring down eternity. I cannot stress how fucking cool that is. What the hell is up with you today? Are you high? No life? Are we here? No life. Rick and Morty. At this point we all know about these... Bastards. I mean, between the entirely oversaturated Pickle Rick meme and the Szechuan sauce fiasco and the uh, dragon orgy, look, Rick and Morty's got a particular style of humour, one that I'm not too keen on, at least not past the first couple of seasons. Like, remember when the plot was Morty's dog in a mech suit trying to take over the world? Now it's... 
incest. Yeah, sure, okay. Anyway, one of the show's creators, Justin Roiland, actually founded his own video game studio, Squanch Tendo, now Squanch Games, back in 2016. You may or may not have heard of Accounting or Trova Saves the Universe, but undoubtedly the studio's biggest game to date is High on Life, a game that's racked up a bit of notoriety for daring to ask, what if we made the most annoying game possible? High on Life has an interesting premise. It's a first-person shooter with some Metroidvania elements where the main draw is the guns themselves are characters, who talk to you during combat and comment on things, etc, etc. I think that idea is pretty neat. Unfortunately, this idea's been married with current Rick and Morty style of humour, which is to present a potentially humorous situation, then repeat the punchline to said situation ad nauseum until a consistency of blood pouring from my ears is achieved. And I think it's worse here in High on Life because said humorous situations aren't exactly funny to begin with. Now, full disclaimer before I get into this, humour is subjective, you might get a chuckle or a hearty chortle out of the game yourself, but for one example, this dollar store Ziltoid is in the business of selling alien cum. He goes on and on about how much other people love buying the cum he offers, about how it's the finest cum around, and even gives you a free sample, a gallon of alien cum that sits in your inventory for the rest of the game and gives you an achievement for beating the game with it on you. Even if you ignore the optional dialogue choices, this scenario stretches itself out at least five times longer than it needs to, and the eventual punchline that he can't sell you more cum right now because he needs time to rest is lost because by that point you've checked out and just want to move on. Another example of its awful humour is this little fucker. In the first level he starts following you around, telling you his life story or commenting on things you do in the most irritating fucking way possible. Oh, like I was saying, so I joined the D3 out of desperation and it was still something. Easy, I've been aimless most of my life. Uh, I'm alone here, to be honest, and just in a valley covered with sludge and Fergals. But at least the Fergals don't judge me. My, 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 you're sitting on mine! We, we gotta get through here fast. The two guns you have by this point both acknowledge that this guy is the most annoying goddamn thing on the planet, but eventually you're able to kill him, as if the game's saying, hey, as a reward for putting up with this puntable little shit, we'll let you kill him. This game dares to allocate the annoying little shit who will never shut the fuck up status to a single character in a game where no one ever shuts the fuck up, showing that the game has absolutely no self-awareness. I think the writing's gonna turn a fair few people away from this one, and yeah, understandably so. Like, sure, there are sliders in the options menu to adjust how frequently your guns and the silly aliens you fight spew annoying clips, but that doesn't make the long stretches of dialogue any more skippable than they currently are. Spoiler alert, that's the un kind of skippable. And personally, I only really laughed a few times. For example, once, because I recognised the voice of Zack Fadel, aka Psychic Pebbles, and he's got a funny voice, or another time, because the melee weapon is a foul-mouthed Aussie who says cut, and Aussie's swearing is always funny, even as a native thong wearer myself. I'll slice in the f***ing dare, I'll cut their f***ing heads off, oh, I'll f***ing I'll rip their limbs, I'll f***ing do everything I want, and I'll f***ing cut right into them, I'll cut their f***ing asshole off and eat it. And again, humor's subjective, but High on Life only really has maybe four or five types of jokes up its sleeve. Joke 1, someone does something really messed up and one of the guns calls them out on it. Joke 2, gee whiz this sure is a video game. Joke 3, gee fucking whiz this sure fucking is a fucking video game. Joke 4, uh, oh man I, I, I sure do love stammering a lot to draw out the dialogue as, mu as, as much as possible. I, I, I like I like repeating the punchline as, as, much, as, as much as possible until you... Uh, until you fucking hate me and never want to use me again and replace me with the f f fucked up gun that gives birth to the babies that you fire at enemies? Like how, like, like, like how gross is that? He's, he's popping, he's popping babies out of his whatever every few seconds for you to just fling it at, 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 at enemies? Isn't that, isn't that kind of, isn't that kind of fucked up? That's, that's kind of, that's kind of fucked up, right? It's not, it's not just me. That's, that's, that's fucked up. That's fucked up, right? That he uses his that he uses his babies as ammo? That's kind of fucked up. Joke five. Whoa, a trippy boss. What is this? The critically acclaimed Metal Gear Solid? Whoa, a skate park. What is this? The much beloved Tony Hawk's Pro Skater? Whoa, a hole. What is this? The hit indie game Donut County? Another hole. What, what is this? The, the the hit indie game Donut County? Jesus Christ, game. I was being slightly hyperbolic. You know what really stings though? When you put aside all the awful writing and the bad jokes, the game's actually kind of good. 
No, for real, there's actually a really neat little game hidden underneath all the dumb alien guns never zip in their lips. Even if the gameplay itself is not without its own issues, I ended up completing the game in three days because it kind of had me hooked. The combat and exploration was a lot of fun, hearkening back to the days where games were six hours long, unabashedly linear, and all the better for it. At its core is the combat system, which I've heard referred to as Discount Doom, and they're not far off the mark. There's an emphasis on staying on the move at all times, which is backed up by having a pretty good selection of traversal options that gradually unlock as you play. The dodge move is a bit pitiful, but you can upgrade it to the slide bash, which lets you slide into enemies and send them flying, or quickly zip out of combat and let your health recharge, and it's pretty satisfying. You also get a jetpack, which lets you hover in mid-air for a short time and rain glob shots from above, and your melee weapon also doubles as a grappling hook. You definitely feel like a bit of a badass moving around the battlefield at times, and each combat encounter is pretty well designed, so that you're always moving and swinging about effortlessly. Yeah, I don't like the guns though. I mean, only because as we previously established, they don't know how to put a gosh dang cork in it, but if we ignore that they're insufferable pricks for a moment, they're pretty good when it comes to applying bullet to alien head. There are only six weapons overall, four main guns, a melee weapon, and an instant wind gun you get for the final 20 minutes, but it's a pretty good little lineup, and they get upgrades and alt fires and stuff to make things more interesting. Kenny's your starter pistol, but unlike, say, most other pistols in gaming, they retain their usefulness for the entire game with very good damage output and accuracy and a very fun trick shot that lets you juggle enemies mid-air. Gus is the shotgun, shaped like a frog. Mmm, where have I seen this before? Mmm. But he also fires discs that ricochet off enemies, and ADS sucks enemies in close for a point blank shot. I wish his damage output was a bit higher considering his fire rate and clip size is pretty low, but he's still a fun guy to slide bash into combat with. Sweezy is a needler, in all but name, and the fact that she can shoot time bombs that you can shoot at to make explode, I guess. And Creature, yes that's literally his name, gives birth to little me-seeks looking dudes that latch onto enemies for continuous damage and also do the funny mind control thing, like the infector from Ratchet and Clank 3 if it wasn't a giant piece of crap. Even Knifey, the melee weapon, is pretty good, as for some reason he has godlike range and can kill some of the stronger enemies in two or three hits. It's a small selection of weapons, sure, but each weapon has its place in combat, and I don't think I really neglected any of them, though this is probably due in to swapping to different weapons and using their trick shots while others recharge theirs, which is a smart way of getting people to use every weapon, I think. Enemy variety's decent, it feels a bit shit at first because most enemies are the same shade of cyberpunk yellow, but I reckon there's enough variety to last the game's 8 or so hours. I really like the way they go about displaying an enemy's health. Rather than displaying a big ol' health bar above their heads, they'll slowly be drained of their colour as they take damage until they're wrinkly grey imitations of their former selves. Oh, and the bosses, dude! They actually kicked my ass a bit! Some of them feel a bit old school where you attack them in phases before they send out goons or you gotta start dodging stuff for a few seconds, but others are relentless. They don't give you any breathing room to sit back and recharge your health. The Skrendel brothers in particular, mm, they had me dropping a few profanities, I tell you what. I don't know if they were actually harder, I'm just bad at video games, it's probably the latter. Outside of combat, the game's a bit of a metroidvania light. You'll be returning to old levels often, mostly because there's only really three main levels and new bounties will simply have you go to new areas within each of these levels, but also because you'll gain new abilities that let you access new areas. The game doesn't do a lot with your abilities if you follow the critical story path, but if you choose to go off and explore, you'll be tested a little bit more than you would be otherwise, and exploring is genuinely worth it too. You'll find chests that give you currency to spend on new upgrades, significantly more than enemies drop, or you'll find upgrades themselves, unique ones that you can't buy in shops. Exploration is generally pretty fun. And I think jumping back and forth between levels so much for the story helps with this because, for example, you'll be asked to go back to the desert world, then your radar will pick up a nearby collectible, so you run off and nab it, and then another one appears on your radar and you run off and get that. Then you might spy a nearby rooftop you couldn't reach before, and then suddenly you're on the other side of the map and have completely forgotten that you're supposed to be going to kill someone, or whatever the story wants you to do. Again, there are only three worlds to explore, save for Earth, which appears at the start and end of the game and is just a corridor of enemies, and there's not a lot of variety in its environment. There's a city overlooking a slum, a forest near a mining operation, and the desert level hides a neon soaked city beneath it, so there's not a lot to explore, but what is there is still enjoyable to poke around in. And the levels have memorable enough layouts that the lack of a map, while kinda silly regardless, wasn't too much of an issue. There's also these warp disc things, like you go to designated parts of an area and can warp in small chunks of other planets, and I can't work out what most of them are actually for. There's this skate park one that gave me some money for beating a challenge, but the others I did, smashing up a miniature town, solving the trolley problem, and connecting pipes to help some alien eat another alien's never-ending dookie, it was like the reward was the joke they were trying to tell, and I'm sorry but there's nothing less I would like to collect for completion than a fucking high on life joke. 
that's the thing though. I wish this game was funny. I wish the game had halfway competent writing and jokes that didn't go for three minutes too long because I think this would have been a cult classic in the making. Hell, maybe it will be because as far as I can tell, people really dig the humor. Everyone on Twitter was bashing it for being the most obnoxious and exhausting game ever made, but then you go on YouTube and TikTok and you look at comments under reviews of it and it's largely the exact opposite reaction. They'll be like, wow, this is the funniest game ever. And they post a clip where you shove a gun up the villain's asshole or you shoot that one 30 year old child or whatever. But like I've said several times now, humor is subjective and that humor is likely going to be the deciding factor on whether you play high on life or not. If you like the writing, you're gonna have a great time because there's a pretty competent game hidden beneath the foul-mouthed alien guns. It's a fun metroidvania, it looks pretty great apart from the Homer Simpson ass alien NPCs, and combat's pretty engaging. But if the humor's not your cup of tea, there's a good chance the game might not be worth persevering with considering how much of the game is the humor. For me, personally, the gameplay just barely outweigh the egregious humor, but for others, it might not be enough. If you have Game Pass, give it a try anyway. Maybe you'll be pleasantly surprised. Maybe you'll hate its guts. That's the beauty of Game Pass. And I'm not just shielding because they sent me a code for a subscription. I've been subscribed to the service almost uninterrupted for the past few years, you know? It's good because you get games like this and you think, eh, maybe it'll be fun. Well, I don't know if I'll vibe with it or not. But instead of having to whip out a hundred bucks and risking paying for a game you might not like because no one knows how to make a gosh dang demo these days, if you're on Game Pass, you can download it hassle free. And if you like it, you like it. If you don't, you don't. Boom. Banish from your hard drive forever. And then you go and install Tinykin instead because Tinykin slaps. The late 90s had collectathons and the 2010s had gritty third person shooters, so I'm really glad the genre that seems to have inspired a lot of games in the early 20s are open world games that use Breath of the Wild's climbing and gliding and let you go anywhere right from the start. Chia is the latest game to feel at least a little bit inspired by Nintendo's open world explore em up, but with a few fresh spins of its own. Namely, you can be cow poo. This game makes me feel seen. Chia is a relatively chill open world exploration game that just released on PS4 and PS5 as a day one PlayStation Plus extra title, as well as a timed Epic Games Store exclusive on PC, which is where I'm playing. If you know me well enough, you're probably expecting a recommendation and you'd be absolutely right. It scratches an itch that similar games like Little Gator Game did for me last year, but on a much grander scale and with considerably more baby consumption. Those little bastards had it too good for too long. Quick disclosures, uh, developer Awaseb provided me with a code for the game just after launch, absolutely appreciated, but also I apologize in advance if I pronounce anything wrong. See, everything in Chia is based off of New Caledonia, a French archipelago off to the west of Australia, out in the Pacific Ocean. And pretty much every aspect of the game is inspired by the culture and customs of the indigenous Kanak people, who call it home, though all of the names here are fictional out of respect for the culture. So when you're not gliding and climbing and throwing dogs into the ocean, you'll be participating in totem carving, playing the ukulele or dry fern leaves, eating their food, preparing kutums, and a whole bunch of other stuff. The game is steeped in culture and you can feel it in almost every inch of the game, from the towns and villages you visit to the gorgeous soundtrack that accompanies you most places. Chia is a labor of love, an ode to the developer's homeland, and it's a very sincere game that's full of heart because of it. Even despite its surprisingly goofy tone, I wasn't expecting Chia to be this silly, but through both its gameplay and story, it's not afraid to be funny, or even a little bit morbid at the same time. So Chia's a girl living on an island with her dad, hanging out and slapping fern leaves and waking the neighbors at all hours of the morning, when suddenly her dad gets taken away by a henchman of King Miyavora. Enlisting the help of the inhabitants of not New Caledonia, she sets out to seek audience with the king and hopefully get her pops back, while making plenty of time to pet every animal she sees, go diving for pearls, and dressing up like a crab. The story's pretty decent, largely bolstered by some good characters, especially Chia herself, who looks sweet and innocent but can certainly be impulsive and… Mm, in the moment, I guess. It's also held up further by its sense of humour, like how for example being tasked with gathering items for a cartoon to see Miyavora by his receptionist, while the next guy who walks in gets to see him right away because he was lucky enough to pull the right number. Also a few times where you can keep doing some very awkward actions with another character for as long as you like. Are they going to be homosexual? 
At the crux of its gameplay is Chia's ability to soul jump. Slap that L1 button and you'll be able to aim at any animal or some inanimate objects you see, then possess them and horribly displace them from their family or owners. There are almost 40 animals you can possess, though it's a bit cheeky they say that when around half of them are fish who all do the same thing. But you can also be dogs, birds, deer, boars, cows, fat little friend-shaped geckos and even a couple of creatures based on the island's folklore. Possessing critters is fun, but I think possessing inanimate objects is even more so as it ties into Chia having a pretty decent selection of moves that make traversal across the open world really fun. So you can become a rock, right? Dumb, you say. Stupid, you hark. What use is becoming a lump of mineral that lacks locomotion? Ha! <laughs> yeah, what now, bitch? Hold on, hold on, there's more. Get that up, you Jesus. She is pretty nimble. She can climb almost any surface in the game, glide through the air, slide down hills for a burst of momentum, catapult from the tops of trees, this is exactly as fun as it looks. But stringing these together is when the game really starts to sing. Catapulting from tree to tree, zipping down a mountain slide, flinging yourself into the air, then jumping into a rock or a coconut and rolling along until your soul meter depletes and you have to jump out. So you leap straight out, cling to a tree and start all over again. And it was just as fun doing it the hundredth time as it was the first. There's a lot to do in these islands too. The map's not huge, but I only see that as a strength as it makes it easier to navigate, but there's still plenty to do and find. In terms of collectibles, there are soul fruits you can consume to increase your stamina meter, which is used for climbing, gliding, and holding your breath underwater, and trinkets and pearls, which can be traded in for cosmetics, which themselves can also be found in chests. There are also campfires, places where you go to do funny scream, and docks to unlock, as well as a slew of challenges including races, shooting galleries, and diving boards. You can also carve totems, which are used to unlock doors to one of the game's eight shrines, where completing a challenge within will increase your soul gauge and allow you to become one with your trash self even longer. That's not including including the rock stacking that grants you access to soul melodies that let you summon animals, change the time of day, and a bunch of other stuff, or the enemy camps that will give you even more treasure chests and soul fruit. It sounds like a lot, but Chia's world is very dense, and you often won't have to go very far to find your next trinket or stumble across another enemy camp. And yeah, speaking of, Chia does have combat. This isn't a non-violent video game like you may have thought by looking at screenshots, but it's also not a big focus and it's not very in-depth because of it. Enemies are made of fabric and have to be set on fire to defeat them, so you need to either possess or throw an explosive or flammable object at them. Jerry cans, lamps, mysterious ooze, cow poo for some reason. It's pretty fun at first, possessing lamps and flinging them at enemies, but due to enemies dying in one hit as well as your health, your stamina meter, recharging almost immediately, death is a rare occurrence. Combat became about making my own challenges. How quickly can I clear this camp? Can I defeat every enemy without touching the ground in human form? But then the end of the game has some particularly large enemy strongholds where not only is finding every enemy in fabric pile kind of tedious, but explosive items can be hard to spot. Keeping my inventory stacked up with explosives was a bit of a hassle, especially when the game was asking me to choose between explosive rocks or the animal friends I kept stashing in my inventory. Because the dogs are free, you can just take them home. Oh, I might not have a room. I guess I'll have to get rid of my crap. Be free. <laughs> my only other major complaint is that it does feel a bit like the soul jump mechanic goes underutilized. There are not a lot of places that require the use of animals or their natural talents, especially if you only follow the main quest line. You might possess a dolphin or a shark to move quickly and circumvent the lack of oxygen underwater, or most commonly, you'll summon a bird to fly from one location to the next as quickly as possible. But most other animals don't get their time in the spotlight. The one place they do is during a treasure hunt side quest, where you decipher maps to find the location of a chest that contains some backstory on one of the game's villains, as well as a bit of treasure and another map to lead you to the next one. Again, the soul jump feels a bit underused here, where you'll only ever need the occasional dog, crab or lamp, maybe a fish if swimming is required, but this treasure hunt side quest plays into one of Chia's biggest strengths. It may not look it, but these islands have an incredibly memorable layout that you'll likely commit to memory pretty easily. And Chia's confident about this, because while there's a map and a compass, you can't see your current position on the map, only when you find and examine signposts. You can use pins to point you in the right direction, but otherwise you're on your own, and there were a few times where I was like, ah sh**, I'm lost. Um, uh, oh, I know that tree, I must be around here somewhere. And it was deeply satisfying to know that I was right. The treasure hunt plays off of this. Early maps basically hand you the location on a silver platter, but later maps really require you to have been paying attention, and I get the feeling that if I replay this in a few years, and I very well might, it'll be like returning home after moving away to go to uni or something. 
Still, while I wish Chia used its neat little possession mechanic a bit more, its world is memorable and Awaseb are confident that you'll be able to navigate it even without an icon on your map pinpointing your exact location. The treasure hunt plays off of this strength and ended up becoming my favourite part of the game because of it, even if I'd hoped it asked me to think a little more outside of it. But in its own way, that's to the game's strength as well. I hesitate to label this game wholesome in the same vein as games like Tinykin and Little Gator Game because of its subject matter, but it's still chill as heck. It's relaxing, it's one of those make your own fun kinds of games you can let loose and unwind with. Maybe being a bird doesn't have any other practical use outside of being a hasty method of travel between objectives, but you can still poop on people at will, so like, it's shitting in people's food makes up for that, right? Yes. Yes it does. So yeah, she is pretty gushed and good. I enjoyed it enough to try to 100% it, which is something I don't do a lot. 21 hours later and I've found everything barring a few fish that I can't be asked to find, so 99% eh, it's close enough. But even if you just beeline to the credits, I still think Chia is a very charming and enjoyable little game that's made with a level of passion, love and respect that shines through every single aspect of it. And you can play as cow poo. I cannot stress that enough. There's a lot of poo in this episode, what the f***? <laughs> So this one kinda stings. I love Forza, both Motorsport and Horizon. Forza Motorsport 3 and 4 in particular were the games that finally had me convinced that maybe Gran Turismo could finally be dethroned as the console sim racer. Hell, I'm one of the world's six Forza 7 apologists. That game rules, you're just playing it wrong. Forza 8's finally hit. oh sorry, it's a reboot. Uh, Forza Motorsport's finally here after a six year hiatus since 7, but it sits in the same space that Gran Turismo 7 does for me. Jump in a car and do laps around a track and it feels amazing. But every other system at play seems intent on hampering that enjoyment, and I'd go as far as saying that Turn 10 seem kind of out of touch. Taking criticisms aimed at previous Forza games and addressing them in well-meaning but pretty silly ways. Hell, I'd argue that this is this year's Cyberpunk. It's launched in such a state that will test your patience with shoddy PC performance and progression resetting bugs. At least those can be fixed. Whether the game's divisive progression will be addressed is still up in the air. So Forza career modes tend to mix things up with every new release, which is neat, but it tends to be very hit and miss. Everything up to 4 has a more open career mode with a good mix of progression and freedom, and then everything afterward feels too rigid and curated, from 6's play these exact championships in this exact order 6 times, to 7's homologation system. Forza 8's Builder's Cup, complete with improper grammar, is no different, and I think it's progressed in some ways, but regressed in a lot of others. The big new thing is the car point system. Driving a car repeatedly, performing clean sections, following the racing line, getting good lap times in practice mode and overtaking opponents gives that car XP and levels it up, and with each new level gained you unlock new parts to equip to your car, as well as a steadily growing pool of- Ah oh, no sweetie, why did you name it that? I kinda like this system. In theory, what it's supposed to do is get you to form a bond with and give half a shit about the cars you drive, sticking with them long enough to unlock the best upgrades like engine and drivetrain swaps and body kits. It's also probably to deter people from jumping into a car, immediately sticking a V12 in it, then jumping online and piling into every opponent on turn one. What it actually does is turns owning cars into a tedious grind. Even if you buy duplicate cars, they always start at level 1, so you can't, for example, buy an RX-7 designed for racing, level it up to 50, then buy another for drifting, and immediately tune it as you see fit. You'll have to go through the grind again, and after finishing a 6 race series, which typically takes about 2 hours including practice sessions, I'd find a car would be anywhere between level 20 to 25, so that's a 3, 4, maybe 5 hour grind just to unlock parts. In fairness, Forza was pretty quick to pump out an update that lessened the grind, lowering things like weight reduction from level 20 to level 12 and body kits from 50 to 20. You still need to level up to get the car points necessary to install these parts, but since everything unlocks quicker, you can tune your car however you like within a shorter time frame. It's a good change, but I expect people would still prefer the alternative of simply spending credits on parts instead. At least if the career mode complemented the system well, it would be a little less of an issue, except wow, it doesn't. The career mode is very similar to Forza 7's, a bunch of series filled with 5 or 6 races where you're limited to a particular kind of car, like hot hatches, JDM classics, modern muscle, etc. One of the biggest criticisms of Forza 7 was that outside of an open series, any one car could only be used in one specific series. An Impreza could only be used in the Modern Rally Championship, the McLaren F1 in the Retro Supercars event, yada yada. It's the exact same issue here, except now it's lampshaded because they want you to use cars repeatedly to max out their level, but do not give you the space to do so. Like I mentioned, by the time you finish a series, your car's sitting in the low to mid 20s, so if you want to max it out, you've got to either run it in free play or online. 
Hell, you can't even take previously leveled up cars into the open class events where you can use any car. The game forces you to buy a new one. It's absolutely one of the most tone deaf things Turn 10 has ever done in the history of this series, and yet what frustrates me most is that it could be an enjoyable system. I mean, I think we'd all prefer if it was gone entirely, but if it were paired up with a career mode or progression system similar to an earlier Forza Motorsport or Gran Turismo, where you acquire a car and use it across multiple events, it'd at least kind of make sense. Buy a crummy used Lancer for the Sunday Cup, then level it up so it can be competitive in other events like the Clubman Cup or the Evo meeting or whatever. Again, not the preferable method of progression, but at least the two pieces would fit together. Locking upgrades behind an EXP system, but not giving enough EXP to unlock all of a car's parts before you can never use it again in the career mode is asinine. It's all cock no balls. I'd explain my reasoning behind this analogy, but I like making money. For all my criticisms of the Builder's Cup though, I still kind of enjoy it. Way more than Gran Turismo 7's weird, silly, stupid, no good cafe menu shit anyway. Feels weird to say GT7's the one that was way too generous with prize cars compared to Forza. Like, I only owned 12 or so cars in the 15 hours I played, which is a nice change of pace for the series, you know? For me, the biggest issue is there's nothing here. Tutorial aside, there are 20 events split amongst five tours, each having four series consisting of five to six races each, and then a single race showcase at the end of each tour. There are around 100 races here, which I do appreciate that between doing practice laps at the start, followed by the 8 to 12 minute race afterward, races do feel kind of substantial, like actual events for a change, instead of the usual 2 to 4 minute bullshit. But it still feels totally gutted compared to any Forza prior. Almost all the events are about driving mundane cars, Japanese tuners this, German saloons that. There is not a single event that has you driving anything faster than an Aston Martin. All those cool hypercars you see in the shop? Can't use a single one in the career mode. All the actual racing cars, the GT3 stuff, the LMPs you'd find roaring down the Mulsanne straight? You wanted to drive those? <laughs> Free play or bust. So just to reiterate, the motorsport vehicles are not usable in the career mode of a game called Forza fucking Motorsport. Nope, those events are coming later as limited time tours that you have about a month to finish before they go poof. The perfect mix of FOMO and drip feeding to create the ultimate Remy Raccoon proof experience. At the bare minimum, I think these eventual limited time tours should be added to the game permanently. But in an ideal world, they just put some damn events in the game right from the start, you know? You're telling me you only have 20 slots for career events and you couldn't fit in some proper motorsport events, yet you wasted two of them on championships where you can only drive an MX-5 or a Fox Body Mustang? As it is, when Forza Motorsport eventually goes offline, it'll become the Guitar Hero Live of racing games. All the cool songs will go poof and you'll be stuck with <laughs> fucking Berserk by Eminem. <laughs> Except Forza Motorsport is always online and requires a connection to download information for these events before you can enter them because it's a stinky games as a service model, so actually when it goes offline it just becomes lost media. An urban legend like Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, or Tracy Grimshaw. The thing that really sucks though, oh god it feels so good to play. All issues aside, when you just driving? This is the best the series has ever felt, at least on a regular old gamepad. The way the game handles traction and grip in particular feels like a huge improvement over 7. There, you push beyond your car's limits and kind of get thrown into a drift, whereas here there's a more realistic build up to that moment. There's a spectrum of control, more than 7's old, almost binary system of, you're in control! Now you're not, dumbass. Ever since Forza got weather and time of day options, it's always said that you'd be able to really feel the difference of the warmer tarmac during daylight as opposed to roads during colder night racing, but it was kind of hard to spot. Here, I started a race at Laguna Seca in the middle of patchy morning fog and felt I could push my car without losing control, but by the time the road had warmed up as the fog parted and let the sun through, I was wrestling with the wheel a bit more as I started to oversteer. The upgrade system also really helps me get to know which parts do what, so I can really feel the exact differences between a stock Bentley Continental and when I slap better parts onto it, going from handling like a boat to a jet ski, and knowing exactly what caused it. That sounds dumb, yeah, but I'm also dumb. Tuning cars is an art, and I am finger painting. Of course, problems don't magically disappear when you're out on the track either. AI is still laughably stupid. Brake checking me on the straight at Spa, or getting caught up doing 40Ks an hour at the inner loop at Watkins Glen. But let first place get too far out in front on most difficulties, and you're really gonna bust your ass trying to catch up to them. It's as if they can drive perfectly when they can adhere to the racing line, but the second they leave it, you can see the intelligence debuffs flying off of them. Visually, it's also a bit of a mess. Uh, I played a bit of this on both PC and Xbox Series S, and on 
on performance mode on the latter, while it clung to 60fps for its dear life, the environments took a pretty big hit. Lens flare and lighting can also be really obnoxious, especially when it gets so bright that you can't even see the racing line, and PC performance is real shaky, at least on my system. Fair play, I don't meet the recommended specs with my 2060 and i7-8700, but I still got anywhere between 60 to 80fps at 1440p on medium with DLSS set to performance mode. Some tracks would tank my frame rate though, particularly Suzuka and Road America, despite running just fine in more demanding wet weather conditions. The biggest ding against the game though, at least at the time of writing, is the fact that I simply cannot play it as intended. There are some incredibly frustrating bugs to prevent progress. The most common one for me is the game locking up on this screen after applying new upgrades following a race, forcing a restart which, for some reason, remembers your car level but not what races you did. If you did four races before encountering this bug, you have to do those four races again the next time you load in. My fix was to simply do a race, quit out of the game immediately after, load back in, then apply upgrades, rinse and repeat for every race, which, yeah, tedious as hell. Except Except at some point not even this worked, as I'd do a race, quit before applying upgrades, open the game again and I'd be right back where I started last session. Between these two bugs, which happened no matter what system I was playing on, my progress was erased 9 times in my 15 hours of playtime, and I'll be totally honest, it's kind of unacceptable. At least it can be fixed, but the one thing I truly despise in video games is having my time wasted like that. Keep in mind as I say this, as I didn't try any online modes so I can't say if it fares any better there, but as of now I can't recommend Forza Motorsport. Even though it's absolutely the best in the series when it comes to the core driving experience, everything, everything surrounding it is either a questionable mess or just plain unacceptable. With exception to some PC performance issues in their first few attempts, Forza has always been an incredibly polished and content rich experience, so to see the new Forza in a state that can really only be described as a shell of its former self is both disappointing and perhaps an indicator that something just ain't right with game development these days. Something really has to change. There is hope, as the game's intended to be a platform upon which Turn 10 will build and improve, offering new tracks and monthly events, so eventually it'll probably be a game I can recommend, albeit maybe with a couple of asterisks. But like, ugh, man, 2023 is filled with so many good games that people are spoilt for choice, and of course the game I was most looking forward to turned out to be the year's Cyberpunk. Okay, maybe not that extreme depending on your own experience, but there's a great game here somewhere, so if Forza Motorsport dies before it can reach its true potential, I'm gonna be so fucking mad. Wow. Bluey is straight up one of the best things on television right now, but most importantly, it prints money. Which means of course it was going to see a video game adaptation at some point. Thankfully, Artax Games, developers of titles I or you have never heard of, and Outright Games, publishers of such hidden gems as Ice Age Scrat's Nutty Adventure and My Friend Peppa Pig, answered the call with the inventively titled Bluey the Video Game. That's right folks, for just 60 upside down dollars you can experience such gripping genre defining gameplay experiences as keepy uppy, find the newspaper, and well honestly I'm kind of struggling for a third thing this joke kind of fell apart. Fair play, I'm obviously not the intended audience for this one. Even though there are a lot of adult fans of Bluey, myself included, the game was very obviously not made with catering to an audience over the age of 7 in mind, but kids also aren't stupid. My siblings have been playing both Ratchet and Clank and Fortnite for years and they started out as young as 6. Obviously don't let 6 year olds play Fortnite, that wasn't my choice lmao. So I want to tackle Bluey from two different perspectives. That of a gamer who's been so for at least 23 of their 30 years on this planet, and that of a small child who just wants more Bluey. Because I think that's an important thing that people missed when reviewing and discussing the Bluey game. It's for toddlers. So is it actually good for toddlers? As someone who grew up minding them, being in a household with 7 other children, I think my two cents is worth a little something here. Anyway, the healers are on holidays, and after one chaotic morning, they discover a third of a torn treasure map leading to treasure the bandit and his brothers buried as kids. With nothing better to do, they set out to grab the remaining pieces, dig up the treasure, and be home in time for Pavlova and Endamami Beans. The game split up into four episodes, with each one furthering the treasure hunt and unlocking a new area for exploration, and within each episode you do… uh… 
Well, it's a little difficult to explain. Not because Bluey is an overly complex game with multiple different complementary systems at play, but because you don't actually do a whole lot. I might have just said kids aren't stupid, but also kids are, in fact, stupid. So when you're in an episode, gameplay usually boils down to following an icon on the screen until you reach a cutscene, then maybe picking something up and placing it down somewhere, pushing an object or jumping over something. The whole time you're either following an icon at the edge of the screen or Bandit or Chili will spell out exactly what you need to do, so there's never Never any guesswork involved and your hand is held the entire way. <coughs> Still less hand holding than Sun and Moon. Ayo! Sun and Moon are overhated. They've got Brion, okay? Episodes feel like interactive bluey episodes in the most literal and uninteresting way possible because you're being guided through every step and interrupted by a cutscene after almost every tiny action. There isn't any room to think or problem solve, which is disappointing and I think giving kids a little leeway and asking them to use their noodle would have been great. But honestly, I think they'll still dig this anyway. I mean, they're playable Bluey episodes, man. Think about that from a kid's perspective. Sure, as an adult, you've got to do a bit better than that. But a kid who loved Bluey getting to participate in a Bluey episode and controlling Bluey herself or any of the other healers even? Kids would go nuts. Even after having said that though, even taking younger players into account, I do think there's a level of interactivity that was kinda necessary but is ultimately lacking. So the episodes don't have you do much beyond what I've already said, but once you complete an episode, you unlock that area to freely explore. Here, you can find collectibles which gradually fill out your sticker book, mess around with certain objects in the environment, and... Uh... Finding collectibles pretty quickly earns you a slew of wearable hats, which, heck yeah, add hats to a game and that's like two points in its favour. Some of the collectibles you find are also toys that you can pull out from a toy box after you find them, but you can't do much with them. There are balls you can kick around, I guess? Or if you want to waddle around with a plushie, you can do that too? Uh, you just can't do anything with what you find. One of the only interactive elements in the environment are slides, which you do with a simple button press, and another are plants you can water a few times to force them to grow instantly. What the f*** is Bluey omnipotent? Levels are dead empty, save for the rest of the healers who hover around you like flies to poopy. And there are all these set elements that you can't do anything with. Why can't you turn the TV on? Why can't you ride the horse at the playground? All I can do is jump on the bed or become the rogue unit himself and kick the living crap out of my kids. What choice do I have? Okay, in fairness, you do unlock some mini games as you complete each episode, even if they're not setting standards anytime soon. Two of these, Magic Xylophone and Chattermax Chase, are just riffs on Freeze Tag, the former significantly shorter than the latter, and Keepy Uppy requires you to stop a balloon from touching the ground, which bafflingly automatically gives you the win after a few dozen hits instead of being endless. The most interesting of the bunch is The Ground is Lava, where you have to collect three stars by navigating across platforms while avoiding setting foot on the ground. It's dead easy, sure, apart from the platforming being a little iffy due to the twitchy controls and slightly cumbersome perspective, but hey, it's something. On the more positive side of things, visually it's not bad at all. It doesn't perfectly replicate the visual style of the show like, say, South Park The Stick of Truth does, seeing as animations and lip syncing can be a little janky, but it does an admirable job at capturing the spirit of the show, thankfully not resorting to weird looking 3D models for the characters and instead staying true to the show's 2D animated style. Audio wise, the voice direction can be a little weird and it does occasionally sound like the voice actors were never in the same room as each other, but all the original voice actors are here and you can make Bluey and Bingo say babe like they do in the show, so heck yeah, no complaints. The music though? Wonderful. Bluey composer Joff Bush teams up with the developer's own composers to come up with an original soundtrack inspired by songs from the show, and it absolutely nails the playful sounds and delightful melodies Bluey is known for. Particularly the song that plays at the creek, itself inspired by I Know A Place, the song from the creek episode, very nearly brought a tear to my eye when I first heard it, in much the same way the music from the show often would. Even despite its visual faults, the Bluey game's presentation is pretty spot on, and easily the best part of the whole package. 
I do wish the game itself managed to rise to the same level as its presentation though. It's a pretty vapid game all things considered, with bare bones gameplay and not a lot of content in its 3 hour package to justify its $60 price tag. Roughly the same price as games like Hi-Fi Rush and Helldivers 2. And even as a fan of the show, there aren't many references to at least Gorkat. So if you're of an age where you can comprehend that perhaps inhaling your boogers isn't f***ing disgusting, I don't think the Bluey game is worth it. And if you absolutely must play it, pick it up on sale or play it on Xbox Game Pass. But at the same time, what I think is irrelevant. I'm not six years old. I'm well into my double digits, I pay taxes, I think about men. The Bluey game doesn't have to care what I think about it, it's there to please kids. And while I think it could be better in that regard, with more interactable elements, I think kids will like this a lot. It only being three hours to do everything doesn't matter, because kids do repetitive things, always playing with their simple kinda one note toys, always watching the same 80 minute movies on Netflix. They're gonna eat this up, and they're gonna do it many times before they either get bored, the disc wears down from overuse, or they forget about it after the discovering Amazing Digital Circus and has-been hotel content farm videos. Truly, God has forsaken us.